All right. Greetings, everybody, and uh, welcome to my continued series on uh, themes of the 20th century. Uh, we are going to be looking at uh, pre-war Nazi Germany in two lectures. I used to do 1933 to 39 in one lecture, but there's simply too much um, to cover and too much to talk about, so I'm going to break it up into two sections. Uh, this talk in particular will deal with 1933 to 1936. Now, before we begin, I wanted to mention that um, my sort of sense of historical awakening sort of came out of this period of history. My mother was born and raised in uh, Germany, and as a young boy, I traveled to Germany. And of course, as a young boy, going to Germany in the late 60s, early 70s, it was a, a magical fairy tale land with castles and cobble roads and chocolate and schnitzel and everything else. It, Certainly from a child's point of view, when I would travel there, I'd be spoiled rotten by my mother's family. My mother grew up in a small village in the Rhineland of about 2,000 people, so it was very quaint. Her village was established in 1343, just celebrated its 875th birthday. Um, so I kind of grew up, you know, thinking that's what Germany was, and certainly that's what it is now. Um, then as I began to watch films on television as a boy, you know, I was always a bit perplexed why, why the Germans were always the bad guys, you know. But I still enjoyed the World War II films and I just, I, I was sort of trained to accept the fact that the Germans were the bad guys, but I never really, I was too young to really understand what was going on. But, uh, and then in grade six, I had a family history project and um, we had to do uh, pictures and, and write little narratives of her mom or dad or grandparents and have a have a have an index and it was you know quite a quite a big project for grade six and on the front we had to have a a striking visual so um long and short uh this was my striking visual now keep in mind i had no idea what nazism was i had no idea what fascism was i had i knew nothing about the details of World War II, I just simply assumed because I'd seen it in the movies that that was the flag. And I'll never forget handing that assignment into my teacher when she, when she looked at it. And she looked at, the, looked at it, she looked at me, she looked at it, and she said, she said Eric, what, what do you think this is? And I said very proudly, oh, that's the flag of Germany. And she said, well, Eric, no, it isn't the flag of Germany anymore. I'm going to give you this project and I want you to go home and just give it to your mom and explain to her that your teacher asked you to bring it home and that was hoping that your mom could talk to you about it. Which in hindsight was really a good way to approach it rather than she trying to explain it. Of course, when I brought the project home, I was quite upset. I didn't understand. Why did you want me to do this? And that's where for the first time I ever had a conversation about Germany during the war. And uh, from that point forward, of course, um, I was ceaselessly fascinated with this period of history. And then I just became enraptured with history in general. So, so I have a lot of sort of personal connection with, with history, but with this period of history, because my mother was born uh, in 1933, so she was part of that mechanism, that, that war machine, and a victim of it uh, when she would enter the Hitler Youth Program. Uh, when she was about six or seven years old. So right up until the end of the war, um, she was part of that, and she was 12 years old when the war ended. But aside from my own family experience, there's something very, very compelling, ceaselessly compelling. Every student that comes into my class recognizes the image of Adolf Hitler. They recognize the image of what this dreadful symbol symbolizes. And I think there's just so much that we can learn from this period of history about intolerance and bigotry and hatred. And, and as, as, as horrific as it is, it is an incredibly valuable lesson of how things can go very, very wrong very, very quickly. Um, now, if you haven't had a chance, I would strongly recommend my lecture called The Weimar Republic. 
1919 to 1933 because it, it'll it'll explain all the things that happened in that interwar period that allowed the Nazis to come into power. And it'll also finish with how Hitler came into power, which I'd like to avoid at this point because I do go into great detail there. Um, you know, the Nazis were obsessed about image. They were, they, 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 there were more pictures and more film taken of the Nazis, which left so much great primary footage for historians to look at and analyze. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's, there's, there's the imagery of this period of history, I think, is what is really striking, particularly when you look at something like the Nuremberg Rally. So, um, so much to cover. Here's a picture. We're going to start off with this event uh, called when the, the Reichstag, which means Germany's parliament, uh, was set ablaze just weeks after Hitler came into power. Here's an image, just an incredibly daunting image of hundreds of thousands of people attending Nazi rallies. Likely this one is from Nuremberg. Uh, some images of SA or brown shirt soldiers uh, boycotting Jewish owned shops and then more imagery of saluting. I think this might have been taken from the 1936 Berlin Olympics. So a lot of stuff to, to consider. Now we will start by saying that in night, uh, January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor by the President at the time, Paul von Hindenburg, through the legal means within the uh, Weimar Constitution. There was nothing revolutionary about the way Hitler took power. It was all on the up and up, right? Um, and then we will see what happens from there. So, well, as I said, Within the first two weeks, a very curious incident happens where the parliament is set ablaze. And out of that burning of the parliament, the Nazis would implement the enabling bill or the enabling law uh, of February 1933. It was enacted after the Reichstag fire and allowed Hitler the power to make laws with about, without parliament approval for four years. Now, how and why did other political parties consent to this? Was there dissent? Yes, there was, but not enough to stop it from happening. One thing you have to consider is that Germany had been on a horrific roller coaster ride of economic chaos, and of course, the Great Depression of 1929 um, really sunk Germany's economy uh, deeply. And I think that by the time of the Reichstag fire, I should note, by the way, they captured the person that allegedly did it. It was apparently a Dutch communist, convenient that it was a communist. Uh, he was promptly tried and executed. But essentially what the enabling law does is the, is the Reichstag fire enables the Nazis to declare a form of martial law. Many believe that the Nazis themselves were responsible for setting ablaze the Ger Germany's parliament because they knew that they would be able to implement this kind of enabling law, which they did. So, you know, I suppose the other political parties were just going to sit and wait and see what was, hap what was going to happen, but from this point, four years is a heck of a mandate to be able to make laws um, without any interruption. After a series of arrests and political assassinations, the National Socialist Party was the only legal party in Germany by 1933. All the democratic parties had basically been banned or made illegal. Now you have to consider the, um, the tremendous amount of fear and terror that was used to make this happen. Uh, the SA, the Brown Shirts, which is essentially a Nazi private army or militia, had numbered over half a million men by early 1933. There was no lack of young men to go out and be doing the dirty work of the Nazis. And of course, a lot of young people were drawn to the SA because if you're out of a job and you can work for the Nazi party, you get a uniform, you get to hang out with your chums, you get to act tough, you get to be intimidating. You know, unfortunately, it brings out kind of the worst elements within uh, society, but uh, the SA became a formidable force uh, of control within um, the Nazi system. So within six months, the Nazis were the only legal party in Germany. 
In April 1933, three months previous, all non-Aryans were dismissed from the civil service. And Joseph Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda, controlled and censored art, literature, film, radio, and the press. Total control, totalitarianism. It's hard for us to even imagine in a democratic society, whether we're living in the United States or Canada or anywhere else, that this level of control could actually exist. I mean, every film that was shown to the German people had to meet censor standards. Any pictures published, any newspapers, um, any piece of art, literature, all quiet on the Western Front, by the way, gets thrown under the bus and becomes illegal. The author of that book, by the way, is chased out of Germany and he flees for his life. Um, so, I mean, it's quite remarkable when you think of this. And, you know, there were only two other states that had done this before the Nazis on this level. That would be Benito Mussolini's Italy, which by 33 was 11 years uh, in the running, and of course Stalin's Russia, which by 1933 had become a pretty tightly controlled uh, society itself. So, you know, there were models with which the Nazis could kind of look to it, and we now know that Hitler did look to Joseph Stalin and the Soviets with a great deal of respect, like, wow, these guys know how to how to run a tight ship, there's something we can learn from these guys, even though, of course, his pronouncements were fiercely anti-Soviet and uh, anti-communist, which I think he genuinely felt, but there was a begrudging admiration for that kind of dictatorship. So, um, You know, this is an interesting idea. Non-Aryans were dismissed from the civil service. So, already, the Nazis are moving to eliminate people who are in positions of influence that could potentially inhibit the ability of the Nazis to do exactly what they want to do. So they are no holds barred doing precisely what they want and nobody is stopping them, you know, as well. I think this is almost like a, like a, a rolling thunder that is coming through government institutions throughout the 1930s. Here's some pictures of the Reichstag fire, Germany's parliament. Uh, I was recently in, in Berlin at the, it's a beautiful building uh, now, they've, of course they've completely restored it. Um, here's a picture of Joseph Goebbels, you know, he was one of the more sinister Nazis who was more than happy to do all the legwork of, of taking complete control of, um, of German society. And uh, that was his job, the Minister of Propaganda, right, so, all right, <clears throat> well, Legal infrastructure almost seems like a strange choice of words when we're talking about Nazi Germany. Um, one of the things you might recall if you watched my lecture on the Weimar Republic was the, was the issue that one of the mistakes the Weimar Republic made was that when they, dis, when they were writing their constitution and forming their government, they didn't have all the people in positions of influence, whether it be law or or in Supreme Courts, uh, sign an allegiance to the Constitution. All those people who worked in those important positions were um, hangovers from um, the uh, imperial period. So, um, in many ways, uh, you know, Hitler understood that if he was going to get away with what he wanted to do, he needed people in every position that was going to uh, do what they were told or do what they were expected. So, as you can imagine, if you were a Nazi judge or you're signing an allegiance to the Nazi party, you're not going to be getting uh, a, a real fair trial in a Nazi court. I mean, it's pretty well predetermined even before you step inside. So, um, you know, most of these judges, you know, these people that are trained in law, I mean, I just, I think of this picture and all these judges signing a loyalty oath to the Nazi party, I mean, what a tremendous degree of hypocrisy there, because they are the ones that we expect to be impartial, that we expect to be um, objective, and all those kind of things. But uh, I suppose to save your own skin, you're going to do what you need to do. But, you know, there, there is that sense of, you know, shame on you on one level as well. But uh, nonetheless, you know, here they are up on the top, pledging allegiance. So, um, 
Hitler quickly cleared public offices of undesirables and appointed those trusted to carry out Nazi policy. It was that simple. I mean, you know, not only now, by the way, does he have the SA or SA, the brown shirts, to go out and filter into society to do his dirty work, he now also, of course, has the Gestapo and later the SS. So we're going to talk about the Gestapo shortly, but they, 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 the SS starts out as Hitler's bodyguards, but then they become more and more than that. They become pervasive throughout German society. Uh, all judges and police chiefs had to be Nazis. So once again, uh, maintaining that complete control. Uh, the Gestapo, here we go, or secret police under the control of Reinhard Heydrich was given the task of rooting out all non-Nazis on all levels of German society. Okay, so the million dollar question is, how is it that a whole nation, many of whom are decent, law-abiding, liberal, open-minded citizens, fall into this and, and, and be part of this mechanism through their silence? And, you know, I wanted to use a the same kind of um, comparison I use, I use this, um, this uh, comparison when I talk about uh, Stalin's Russia as well because I think there's a lot of striking similarities between the way these two dictatorships operated. I wanted to share with you my thoughts and, and give you something to think about when we try to identify what on earth were people thinking when all this stuff was going on, the political arrests, the assassinations, the intolerance out through the 30s. Let's pretend you're living in Berlin, and uh, you know you've got a wife and kids. You've got a you got a civil servant job. You've learned how to navigate your conversations with people. You're careful what you say. You're you're careful what you do, and you basically just live life and make sure that you're providing a home and safety for your family. Your family is number one. So therefore, you just have come to terms with the way things are, but you're very very cautious. So you're looking out your window across the street where Mr. Smith lives, and you see one day that uh, two Gestapo policemen come to his door, and you're watching this outside your window. He's dragged from his home, dragged down the street, taken to the police station. There are three ways in which you're going to respond to what you have just seen. Number one, you're going to go down to the police station and say, I demand to know what on earth happened to Mr. Smith. I saw two uh, policemen rudely and roughly apprehend him and take him from his home, and I'm here to defend his honor. He's a good man. I've known him for years. Okay, that's number one. Defend him. Number two, close your blinds and don't tell anybody what you saw and hope that it all goes away. Option number three is to go down to the police station and say that Mr. Smith guy you pulled out of his home. I always knew he was a bad guy. Uh, I wanted to come and thank you for doing your duty. Um, I've seen strange people hanging around there too, and I, I just want you to know that I appreciate your service. Right? What do you think of those three is the most popular? Number one, defend. Number two, turn a blind eye. Number three, accuse. Number two, right? That's how the Nazis were able to get away with this because the majority of people were not willing to stick their necks out. And as a result, by not doing anything and not saying anything, you've allowed Nazism to flourish. So, you know, where the Gestapo is concerned, I mean, they are in every town and village, right? And their presence is, is omnipresent. And people are behaving in strange, I mean, they're, they're, they're confronting a strange set of circumstances. People are afraid. Is something going to be caught up to me? Am I going to be accused of something? Is somebody going to turn me in? And unfortunately what this does is a percentage of Germans, now there's no way to quantify this, but some people found that the best way to defend themselves would be to accuse others. Option number three, right? Um, and, and that is the real tragic consequence of, of a dictatorship, when it, it puts people in a position out of desperation, they accuse other people. We saw this kind of thing in the United States in the 1950s with McCarthyism, although people were not executed, but people were turning people in to, to ensure that their own career was saved. So, you know, it's this kind of climate of fear that brings out, can bring out the worst in human nature. 
sometimes it can bring out the best as well. But uh, in this case, you know, the secret police uh, was everywhere. So it was very difficult for you to resist the government, right? Uh, Himmler controlled the regular police and later the SS. Now the SS and the Gestapo, by wartime, they kind of fuse into one big organization. They're, they more or less do the same kind of thing. The Gestapo are the regular police and the SS are the secret police. But once it becomes an entrenched police state, which it certainly was on its way to becoming by mid-1933, those organizations and the SA, by the way, all kind of work in cahoots. So. Uh, Hermann Göring was appointed chief of the Luftwaffe and the Air Force. So people like Hermann Göring, Reinhard Heydrich, Heinrich Himmler, Joseph Goebbels, these are malevolent human beings. I mean, I have, there's no other way to put it. They are not just yes-men to Adolf Hitler, but they think the same way as him. They feel the same way as him. They have no concern about rounding people up and executing people. And certainly later, during the, uh, the, the, the Holocaust, you know, they have no bones about implementing policies that lead to mass genocide. So, you know, these are the worst of the worst of human nature, all bubble wrapped in one uh, dictatorship. So it's quite something, quite remarkable. I mean, Herm, Herman Goring, there's much to say, to talk, I mean, there's much we could say about all of these people individually, but Herman Goring, you know, um, was, uh, you know, during the war years, I mean, he collected looted art from all the museums that the Nazis occupied. At one point, he had the most, the, the largest collection of, uh, of art in his own home, you know. I mean, how do you wrap your head around feeling good about that? Oh, there's my Van Gogh, here's my Renoir. Oh, yeah, uh, it, it, it's in my home now because we... Uh, we took it from the museums in Amsterdam and other places in Paris and so forth. So, you know, very, very unsavory characters to say the least. All right. So, the Nazi Party's full name was the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Hitler used socialist ideas and language to appeal to the working class, although he despised socialism. Okay. So, the name of the party was very, very intentional. German Workers' Party, National Socialist German Workers' Party. The word workers and socialist is a curious choice of words coming from a fascist organization. The reason those names were put in would be to appeal to people that had traditionally been drawn towards left-wing parties, whether it be the Social Democratic Party or the German Communist Party, to draw in those working classes uh, within the Soviet, or rather within the Nazi Party. Um, two of the 25 points of early National Socialism drawn up in 1920 demanded profit sharing in great industries and abolition of all income unearned by work. So there were those sort of socialistic ideas, but that was pretty much the end of it. They were militaristic, nationalistic, anti-Semitic. Um, in every other way, they were unsocialist, other than sort of talking about this profit sharing idea. Many early Nazis liked these ideas and they liked the leader, there he is, Ernst Röhm, right? So he was, um, he was the leader of the brown shirts. Now he goes back with Hitler back to 1919, 1920. They've known each other for years. And the, the SA starts just as kind of like bodyguards for Hitler during when he did speeches in Munich and in Bavaria in the early days of the party. And then, of course, by 1933, it's blossomed into hundreds and hundreds of thousands. I can't remember the exact figure, but it's upwards of, I think, like half a million young men are in this SA organization. And if you are someone like Adolf Hitler, you have to wonder if having an organization with so many foot soldiers in it to be under the, con under the control of anybody but yourself could be a bit of a problem. So. You know, that comes to a head, of course, in 1934. Rome made the suggestion to Hitler that the regular army, that is, the army of 100,000 that the Treaty of Versailles allowed, that 100,000 be scrapped and the SA, the brown shirts with, the, with his socialist ideas, 
as head of the armed forces with him in commander in chief. This was Rome's great mistake when he suggested that he be completely in control of the SA. Um, and others too. I mean, see, the thing was, Ernst Röhm, um, he was a complicated guy. I mean, he was devoted to Hitler, but he was also homosexual, and that was causing a lot of problems within the party too. You know, uh, Nazism is incredibly arrogant and chauvinistic, and, and you know, they were certainly a tremendous intolerance to homosexuality. So that becomes a real liability for Ernst Röhm as well. The turning point is this is that aristocrats and business owners told Hitler they would give him full support if the SA was tamed. The aspect of the SA they wanted to tame were those sort of profit-sharing ideas. And Hitler went, wait a second here, this is my moment because if I can get those guys, aristocrats and business owners, in my back pocket by removing Rome not only do I get the support of business interests behind my party, but I eliminate a potential rival who controls the SA. So as a result, Rome and leading SA figures are rounded up and shot in what is later called the Night of the Long Knives. Uh, but no knives were actually used. They were shot. There were no trials. These men were pulled out of their homes in the middle of the night shot in the street and the bodies were dumped. I mean this was this was and, and it wasn't just it wasn't just um, the SA leadership that was executed. Many people that the Nazis found undesirable were also executed. In fact one of the previous uh, chancellors, uh, von Schleicher, was executed during the night of the long knife. So Hitler saw, well if we're gonna kill a few Let's just kill a bunch of people that, that we want gone anyway. So um, it's a pretty crass uh, moment in, in Nazi history where they, and, where they do this. And, 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 you know, he could claim, which he did in the German-controlled press, that he had eliminated a potential counter-revolution or, a, or a enemies from within. Hey, they stopped this revolution and now the military and the SA are going to have to sign a loyalty oath. Adolf Hitler himself, which they did, and then he had them. So, you know, pretty unbelievable stuff going on here. The new army, yeah, signed a loyalty oath to Hitler himself. So here he is, smiling with Ernst Röhm. All these kind of pictures with Röhm and Hitler together were, were eliminated as much as possible from the landscape um, because Röhm was, was not to be spoken of after this point. So, Well... If you want a Reich or a German government to last a thousand years, as the Nazis would proclaim, you need to absolutely control the hearts and minds of young people. You need to get them at a young age, brainwash them, and you do this for generations, and you have got absolutely brainwashed, committed, devoted Nazis. So therefore, the youth of Germany were especially eyed upon as important in their survival of this new state. They were given special attention. They were seen as blank, a blank slate and perfect candidates for an onslaught of Nazi values. From six years onwards, boys were trained in Nazism. From age 10, girls joined the League of or the Young Maidens, and at 14, they joined the League of German Maidens. And women were encouraged to stay home, marry, and give birth to Aryan children. Kinder, Kiesch, and Kuch. So it's a very patriarchal uh, mentality, of course. You women have babies and bake bread, and we're going to go and fight wars and be masculine. Um, you know, so right off the bat, you've got a system in place that is controlling the hearts and minds of these children very, very early. Biology and history were a special concern in Nazi education. Now think about that. Why biology and history? Well, biology, you can legitimize, rationalize your own racist nonsense. Right? You can make all kinds of excuses to justify this superior race business. History is important because it can be rewritten to satisfy uh, the demands and desires of the Nazi state, to justify 
the great German race and the racism behind it and so on and so forth. So you can rewrite history and biology to suit your needs and that's exactly what the Nazis did. If you get a chance to look at a textbook uh, from Nazi Germany, they are chilling to look through and, 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 and grotesque uh, what, what they say and what they do. You know, math problems uh, that, that look at, you know, what would happen if you eliminated 100,000 people with special needs and divided it by, you know, this kind of thing. Like, it was pretty horrific uh, what kids were, were fed uh, in this period of history. So, kids marched, they sang songs, they hiked. It was great appeal for young boys. Think of Boy Scouts. I mean, that's what it was. You went on camping trips, you sang songs by the fire, you cooked over a hot fire, you did all these things. And, um, you know, I always think of the novel Lord of the Flies when I think about the one character who was always trying to destabilize the young democracy, Jack, who, who sparred with Ralph, who was trying to keep the kids together and make fires and do all the, the logical, rational things. So I do think of this sort of, you know, a bunch of kids just going crazy and, and becoming primal creatures. And, and you kind of see elements of uh, Nazism and Nazi Germany going in that direction too. So. Here's some more pictures. Here we are, young boys. Well, these are probably teenagers. They're uh, marching, singing. They're going to go do something with their shovels. You know, that's the kind of imagery you had. Girls being very fit and athletic with a portrait of Hitler. And, of course, young Aryan boys saluting at probably age seven or eight years old. So, uh, you know, it was pervasive. It was relentless. The control of the state was absolutely everywhere. Well, one of the things that is easy to think about is what, what was the role of the church? Now, you have to consider that the church was as pervasive in German society as it was in French, Spanish, or Italian society. The only real difference in Germany was that you had a relatively equal split in attendance between Lutheran Protestant churches and Catholic churches. But whether you were Lutheran or Protestant, you were a Catholic or you were a Christian, and people were very deeply religious. And Hitler himself was an atheist, and, uh, but he also understood that religion was a very powerful part of uh, German society, and he wasn't about to outlaw that. So he had to make sure that the churches were going to fall in line to some degree. And, uh, you know, once again, he had the role modeling of how... Um, Mussolini would come to terms with the church in Italy, and, and Hitler wanted to do the same thing. Churches were respected in 1933 in something called the Concordant. July, the Catholics and the Nazis agreed to respect each other's territory. The church can exist as always as long as they stay out of politics. Interesting. So you go ahead, you read your scripture, you tell your stories, you give your, your, your lessons, uh, but don't ever talk politics, okay? Keep it about the Bible, and that's fine. Keep politics away from the pulpit. Um, but if you are a good Christian, and you are driven by the forces of good and, and, and equality and love and unconditional love and all those kinds of, those, those really great qualities of, 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 of the teachings of, of Christ and the disciples, um, you're going to have a real hard time uh, looking around at what, what you are seeing in your society and not speaking out against it. And one in particular, Father Galen, was a German count and bishop of Munster, spoke out against euthanasia in 1941, but it was the only act of civil disobedience that was effective in the Nazi period. What was happening, and it was accelerated during once the war starts, uh, was that Hitler was clearing out all his homes that were in, you know, where people with special needs lived, uh, with a variety of disabilities. And they were being euthanized. Uh, because the thinking was that if you were purporting to be the greatest race and creating a master race, you can't have evidence of those who do not fit that profile. So, you know, they, uh, it's a tragedy, you know, that these poor souls were being killed, um, uh, you know, and Galen spoke out against it. And because Galen was very well known and well respected, the Nazis didn't dare uh, eliminate him. And they, they actually stopped euthanasia for a while. 
But for the most part, those that spoke out, both Catholics and Protestants, were imprisoned or sent to camp. So priests were not exempt. So you were, if you spoke out against Nazism at the pulpit, then you were done. Pope Pius XII has often been criticized because he did little to challenge the progressing Holocaust of the Jews out of fear of provoking the Nazis into invading the Vatican City. You know, still the debate, the jury is out on this. You know, was he complicit? Did he know? Did he overlook it? Did he ignore it? Did, you know, um, it's a tough one. And, uh, the, you know, there's still lots of active history being written about the Pope. And uh, it seems pretty clear to me that he was aware of what was happening. I guess one has to ask the question, what could have he have done? And I'm by no means am I an apologist for this kind of action, but I'm just, it's that, that teacher in me that always tries to play the devil's advocate. What could he have done? I don't know. But anyway, lots of good history still being written about this period. All right, the other one. Uh, act of civil disobedience outside of the church, there was only one major event. And um, it was something called the White Rose Movement in München, or Munich, I believe, as it's called. Um, it was led by Hans and Sophie Scholl, who tried to criticize the Nazi regime. So, what it was, is you had this brother and sister team who were students at university. Now, universities are supposed to be places where you learn a variety of things, you find a new voice, you develop your own opinion, you read a variety of sources. It's kind of almost like supposed to be a period in which you blossom and come to learn so much. And, um, you know, a lot of young people, and I see this in, in, in grades 11 and 12, you know, kids are really being connected with social justice issues, whether you're dealing with, you know, uh, the harm of colonialism or the plight of First Peoples in Canada or Native Americans in the United States and so forth. That, you know, that it, 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 it's a natural inclination for young people. And, and one would hope that they would be sensitive and be compassionate about social justice issues. So I think Hans and Sophie Scholl we're doing just that. What happened was they'd heard from a friend who had just come back from leave from Stalingrad. So he'd been in the Battle of Stalingrad, or at least in southern Russia. And of course, when they met him, they hugged and said, Oh, we're so glad you're okay. We're hearing the war is going great in Russia. Tell us about it. And he just looked at them and said, You would not believe what I have seen in Russia. And she, he began to tell them, the real grim realities of not only were they not winning, but they were committing grotesque atrocities on the Russian people. So they were they were overwhelmed. So they Hans and Sophie Scholl decided to write up these leaflets and print them off on this private printing press and leave these things in the uh, lecture halls of um, of um, uh, Munich University. And and you know it creates quite a firestorm. And then the Nazis put these guys in the hallways in the morning and then they catch Hans and Sophie Scholl, they're put on trial, they're found guilty like that and they're executed. So, you know, once again, if there's ever any doubt the willingness of the state to suppress civil disobedience, the White Rose Movement made it pretty clear. In 1943, they were arrested for leaving leaflets in lecture halls at Munich and they and many others within the organization were executed for treason. So, pretty intense. Here they are, Sophie Schoen. This is Sophie, and uh, I think this is Hans. And they're talking to German soldiers. I think you can see he's writing stuff down. They're probably just getting information about their experiences in battle. And, um, you know, and I don't think, uh, you know, maybe some soldiers were more willing than others to impart their experience. Maybe they didn't even realize that they were doing something that was deemed anti-Nazi anti by being honest about their experiences. But, uh, but that's what really triggered Hans and Sophie Scholl. All right, well of all the topics that we look at in any study of pre-war Nazi Germany, and certainly during the war as well, there is nothing more troubling, distressing, heart-wrenching 
than the Holocaust, than the, the anti-Jewish laws that began. Um, it, is a, it is a horrific event, it is a tragedy, and without question it is something that everybody needs to be taught. You know, it is something that we do discuss heavily in history classes, and we should. And I think it is very, very important to face atrocities, stare them down right in the eye, that as painful as it is, as difficult a topic as it is, we simply need to be made aware. And, uh, you know, I would say that of all the topics, um, when we talk about the Holocaust, uh, there's no question that it's the one where the students, I can tell they are very, very, very engaged, fascinated, and also really upset about what they're learning. But they understand why it's important. April 1933, the SA organizes a boycott of Jewish shops, goods, doctors, and lawyers. Okay, this is how it works, you know? What happens is pretty simple. Let's use a village. You got two bakers. They both make pies, they mo both make breads. They both make great products. And for the most part, people go to both. You know, well, Mr. Smith makes great apple pie and Mr. Jones makes great mincemeat pies or whatever. And they go back and forth, right? There's enough of a market for two bakers in this town. Well, once all this anti-Semitism fires up and one of the bakers is Jewish, a, a SA soldier stands in front of the doorway like this. He just stands there. So you walk down to Mr. Smith's Baker to get your apple pie that you love so much and there's an SA guy standing there and, and he goes, oh excuse me, where are you going? And you say, well I'm going to buy a pie from Mr. Smith. Oh, we don't, we don't want you to go in there. Mr. Smith is a Jew. And if you were careful, you'd watch your words. But some people might say, well, I didn't know that. And frankly, I don't really care. He's a great baker, and I've known him for years. You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to stand up to the essay soldier and get a billy club to the head and your name written down and reported? Or are you going to walk across the street to the other baker and get a subpar apple pie. I hate to use a crass example, but that's essentially what happens. And this is how you train and get German citizens to stop buying the services of businesses owned by Jews. This is the same for doctors and lawyers, right? Across the board. So boycotting these businesses is how it happens. 1935, Jews are forbidden to enter public pools, sports fields, and public parks. So I would equate the situation of the Jews in Germany in 1935 very similar to pre-civil rights uh, U.S. in the American South in the 1940s and 50s uh, before changes began to happen there in the late 50s, right? Segregation. You can go here but not there, right? Then the Nuremberg Laws. This is where it becomes, you know, official government law, right? 1935, the Nuremberg Laws further deprived Jews of citizenship, the right to vote, and the right to marry non-Aryans. You are no longer a German. Even though your family has lived in Germany for hundreds, hundreds of years. Even though your father fought for the German Imperial Armies in the Great War. I mean, the tragedy of it is quite remarkable. There were men who were sent to the gas chambers in Auschwitz who pulled out their military service card from World War I and said, I fought for Germany. Germany is my country. And then they would just tear it up and throw it away and off you go. I mean, it's, it's quite, quite staggering. Jews could no longer vote and they could no longer marry non-Jews. Now, what is really tragic are the unions, the marriages that were already in place between Jews and non-Jews, right? What happens then? Does that mean their marriage is no longer legal? Is it invalid, right? And that's when people began to realize that this isn't just another pogrom. This is something entirely new. And, and many people who had the good sense to get out by 1935 could get out before the mass wave of people began to flood out of Germany. So, 
1938, Herschel Grinspan killed a German diplomat in Paris, uh, Ernst von Rath, uh, triggering something called Crystal Night, Kristallnacht, November 1938. This is an absolute huge turning point. Because Crystal Night is the point where German citizens who had largely kept quiet during um, the repressions of 33 to 38 up to this point, where they realized that their silence and their inaction had allowed something like Kristallnacht to happen. I've read many accounts and journals from people who said that for them that was a turning point where they really began to feel guilty that, that they remained silent. What happens in Crystal Night is 814 Jewish shops are looted, 191 synagogues are burned down, and 20,000 Jews are sent to camps, although murder doesn't begin until 1942. This was a wave across the whole country instigated by those brown shirts, the SA, who were undoubtedly given orders to do this, because something like this does not just happen spontaneously. Hitler didn't mention it, he didn't talk about it, but clearly he knew what was going on. So by 1938, the situation of the Jews in, in, in Germany was dire. And unfortunately, once people tried to leave um, and, and, and get on ships like the St. Louis that came over to North America, nobody would take them in. Canada, U.S., nobody, and they'd be sent back and many of whom would die in the camps later after 1942. So. And here's an image of Crystal Night, broken glass. Crystal Nacht means Crystal Night, or it's also called the Night of Broken Glass, because you can see shattered glass all over the streets. Here's a synagogue burning down, and we haven't even talked about the public book burnings. Anything written who was not approved by the censors would be burned. Shakespeare in the fire, um, Milton in the fire, all of it, um, you know, Galileo in the fire, um, All Quiet on the Western Front, Eric Maria Remark, one of the greatest anti-war novels ever written, in the fire. So, you know, you have reached a whole new level. By 1936, the path that Germany was taking had never been seen before on this level. So, all right, and that being said, that will be where we will stop. Uh, next lecture, part two, uh, will deal with Germany from 1936 to 39. And I believe, if memory serves me correct, we will start with uh, the 1936 Berlin Olympics. So, anyway, thank you very much, and uh, appreciate you having a look, and we'll see you again. Take care.